favored him. And about five years before she died, I had bought her this diary. And it was an interesting kind of diary because it asked all these questions. You know, what did you like to do when you were a little girl? Um, what was your favorite food? What was it like where you were born? And my grandmother actually came over from Bermuda. So she actually came through Ellis Island, which I had no clue. I just think that's fascinating. But she came to Ellis Island when she was a little girl from Bermuda. And um, I gave her this diary. I think it was for like maybe her 84th birthday. She lived to be 91. And then I forgot all about it. And so when she passed away, when she went on to be with the Lord, we were cleaning up her house, and uh, my cousin came across it. And she actually had been writing in it all those years. And I had no clue. So after the funeral, um, they gave it to me. But they had been reading from it at the funeral. And when they were reading from it, one of the, the last entries said, you know, my husband has gone on to be with the Lord, and so have my oldest daughter and my oldest son. But my three youngest sons are still here, and they are taking care of me. And I trust God, and I know that one day I will fly away. And that was such a statement of faith at that moment in time. And it was really sad to say goodbye to my grandmother, but it was so awesome to know. That's your favorite song, somebody's favorite song, see? So awesome to know that one day I will see her again. So this is on Flyway. It might be a little bit different from what you're used to, but if you want to sing along, you can clap, dance. If just sit, that's fine too. What do you want to do? This is my uh, my cheat sheet. It tells me where all my tracks are. It's number fourteen. This is uh, my version. Of Good story. What the hell is I had some of those happen. <laughs>
good memories, brings back lots of good memories. Well, my husband and I, we've been married almost two years. It'll be two years in September, September 5th. And it really was a miraculous story. Um, so I'm gonna share it with you because I want everybody to believe in miracles. When I turned about, I'll tell you I turned about 36 and um, I read this article and it said that a woman with my race, my education, and at my age, I had a better chance of dying in a plane crash than getting married. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, that's ugly. I was like, but God, I know you can do it. I know there's a man out there for me somewhere. And so about a year and a half passed and he still hadn't shown up because he was taking his time. <laughs> and so I got real frustrated because the kids in my youth group started getting married. So then I was really like, okay, Jesus. I got to go to one more wedding of somebody who was in the ninth grade and I was mentoring them. I might be a little upset. So um, I came to the conclusion that I had to make a decision that God knew what was best for me. And if God knew what was best for me and I wasn't married, then that must be what's best for me. And that was kind of hard to swallow. So I told the Lord, I was, I, in prayer, I was praying and I said, obviously being single is what's best for me because you know what's best for me. I submit to your will and I need you to know I don't like it. <laughs> this is not easy, but I do want you to know that I love you and I want to serve you. So if this is your will, I need you to help me live this out. And I'm just going to keep on doing what I'm doing, which was doing what I'm doing now, singing and traveling full time. And, and then I let it go. Didn't think about it much, just let it go. It couldn't have been three months later, maybe three or four months later that I got this really strange phone call from this random man. And he said, I saw you on the internet. And that was my first thought, I was like, okay. <laughs> and uh, you know, I wanna know if you would come to my church and do a concert. I'm, I'm doing a concert, would you come? And so I went to the church and I did the concert. I wasn't really paying this guy any attention because I really was kind of clueless, like I wasn't catching the signals. <laughs> so we, he walked me out to the car and he said, you know, I really appreciate you coming and, and serving, you know, using your gifts. I'd really like to show you around the city because I had just moved to Nashville. And I said, I don't need you to show me around the city. I've been here for a while. I know my way around. Thank you very much. Like I said, I wasn't catching the city. <laughs> so then he says, well, you know, I really would like to take you to lunch. We'll go anywhere you want to go. And so I'm going to take you to lunch just to thank you. I said, yeah, okay, give me a call. Yeah, that sounds great. Give me a call. That was in October of 2009. He called, bless his heart, every week from October 2009 to February of 2010. I had actually packed up my apartment in Nashville and went out to the East Coast for the holidays. You know, Thanksgiving and Christmas in the middle of October. Because when you're in full-time ministry, you can do stuff like that. So I packed up and I went to my mother's house and I, I don't think I had told him that. I think maybe like in one of the messages that he left, I called him back and left him. I said, I'm in, on the East Coast, I'll be back in the middle of January. But he kept calling, he was faithful, he was determined. And so when I got back, um, I finally felt like the Holy Spirit was like, you need to call that man, stop being so rude to him. So I called him, and lo and behold, it was a couple days before Valentine's Day. So he didn't call me back because he thought I was just trying to get a date for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, maybe I was subconsciously, but I never did that, you know, to meet Jesus. But anyway, um, we wound up going out soon after that. And the reason why I actually wound up going out with him was because he said he wanted to talk ministry business. He had some ministry ideas he thought I could, he could help me, I could help him with. And Of course, we didn't talk about ministry at all. On the third day, he told me that he was going to marry me before the year was out. I, of course, then proceeded to get in my car and think he was a stalker. Because <laughs> who, who says that? You know, on your third day, who says, I'm going to marry you, and I'm going to marry you before the year is out? Um... And so I prayed and I said, Lord, I have had a lot of broken hearts in my life. I don't want another one. Guard my heart. If he's not the one, 
guard my heart. And we kept dating, dated maybe two more weeks, and I didn't really feel anything. He's just kind of like, oh, he's a nice guy. You know, I like him, he's cool. And one day, we went to lunch, and I went and I was putting some stuff in the car, and I turned around, and he had kind of stepped forward, and it hit me like somebody had punched me in the face. I was in love with him. And I was like, oh my gosh! I was like, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go. And so when I ran, I ran off. And I'm, so I'm driving, driving home, and I'm all flustered and frustrated because, you know, we, at this point we've only been dating about five weeks. And so I'm frustrated, I'm flustered, and I'm like, what's going on? I don't get it, I don't get it. And I was like, Lord, what is this? And I had this memory come back. I had prayed this prayer in 1995. And this was my prayer. I said, Lord, I want to marry a man who comes to me and says, God told me you're the one for me, which is what he did. I don't want a long engagement. I mean, I want it to happen quick because I just don't, I don't want to be engaged, dating a long time, I just don't want that. I got business to do for the kingdom. He either the one or he isn't, so you know, I, I want to know. And the last thing was, I wanted to know quickly. So I'm thinking to myself, I didn't really pray that. that that's just, no, I didn't pray that. So I call up my best friend. She lives in Columbus, Ohio. And I say, I met this guy. And I'm telling her about it. You know, I'm saying, you know, I met him. And he wants to get married. We've only gone out, you know, a couple times. It's been about five weeks. And he wants to get married. He wants to get married before the year is out. And she says, remember that time we were at church, at New Covenant Believers Church in Columbus, Ohio, and we were sitting on the fourth row. She said, that was when you had that crush on that guy, Greg, with the red hair. Remember him? He said, right in front of us. I didn't like him. I told you he was the one for you. And you said, I just prayed a prayer. What you say, girl? This is what I said. I said, well, what did I say? She said, you told the Lord that you wanted to marry a man who came up to you and said, God said that you were the one for me. You didn't want it to be a long engagement, and you wanted to know quickly if he was the one. And my jaw dropped, because first of all, I didn't remember telling her that. And if I had told her that, you know, in 1995, here we were in 2010. Needless to say, my husband and I were married in September of 2010. So it was really just a miracle. Of course, you know, we didn't have any money, and God miraculously provided this awesome wedding where you know, somebody donated all the catering services and somebody donated the photography and my father wound up paying for the rest of the wedding and my mother bought my dress. It turned into this, you know, amazing, amazing experience. So I say all that to say a lot of times when we're waiting on the Lord for something, be it healing or a child to come back to God, you know, or... Um, Whatever it is, a new, a new job, you need finances, you got bills you can't pay when we're waiting for the Lord to act. Sometimes it becomes real easy to say, where are you? Um, what's going on? I don't understand. I don't get it. Um, I'm waiting right here and it doesn't seem like you're answering or you hear me at all. And I know some of you heard this song. I wrote it because I was in a place where I felt like I was praying and praying and praying and God was not answering and stuff was just getting worse and worse and worse. And I had to make a decision. Am I going to hold on to my faith or I'm just going to continue to say, God, where are you? So I wrote this song and the name of it is Where Are You? And it is track number three. Where are you? 
I wrote this, I used to sing this one praise and worship song all the time, all the time. Every time I'd go to woods, I'd sing it. And my father would hear it over and over and over again. And then he went to the movies and saw this one of those Christian movies. And he called me up and he said, congratulations. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I went to the movies and was singing your song. I was like, if that was my song, trust me, you could retire today. <laughs> that wasn't it. So this one, um, you probably know because it's, it was pretty popular. It was one of the most sung Christian worship songs the last 10 years. It is track number 11. Thank you. 
God is like, I just want you to be right with me, and the only way you can be right with me is accept my son because he died for you to cover up all that stuff you've done. So I say all that to say, the reason why that song, that particular worship song, is so important to me is because I got to a point where the Lord is the very air I breathe. Because I'm always messing up. I'm always saying something I shouldn't say. I'm always repenting. Because, you know, I'm from New York. <laughs> and New Yorkers, we have this thing. We react quickly. And then, you know, and this is one of those things y'all can laugh at. I got black girl syndrome, which is my neck likes to go like this. You know, and then you say the wrong thing, and I'll be like, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't say that to every black person you meet, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they do that out here. <laughs> but we sure do it on the East Coast. <laughs> Moving right along. <laughs> anyway. Um, I'm going to sing this song for you. And then I'm going to tell you the story about open pants and pumping gas. Cause that's a good one. We have track number five. This is a song I wrote when one of those youth called me and told me they were getting married. I got mad. I went in my bedroom and I was like, I need some strength here. Can I get a husband? And that scripture came to mind. You know, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. I said, well, I need some strength. Pour it out. And I didn't get a husband that day. I got a song.
I couldn't even wear a pair of jeans. I still had these jeans, had them on the other day. My husband was trying to get me to throw them out, but you know, they're near and dear to me. <laughs> Look at these jeans. So, I actually they're in the trunk of the car, but that's one other story. <laughs> so I'll probably have them all later on this week. <laughs> so, um, I had these jeans, and then I went through a real rough spot for about two weeks. It seemed like everything was going wrong, and I just was not surrendering. I was not talking to the Lord. I was not doing my journal. I was not doing devotions. I was just eating and eating. I was frustrated. I was mad. And then I washed my jeans. And as you ladies know, when you wash jeans, they tend to get a little tight. So I put these jeans on because I'm going on a ministry trip. I'm driving to Maryland. And I'm going to be in the car for eight hours, so I don't really think about it. I put these jeans on, and I had on a pajama top that was, like, it wasn't short, short. But, you know, I like to wear a shirt usually, like, down here. But this one came right to the waist, and that's important in this story. So this one came right to the waist. So I'm driving. I drive about two hours. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, my jeans are so tight. Oh. So I unbutton them because there's nobody in the car but me. And now I'm listening to this book on CD. It's a real good book, one where you know all the things are acted out. There's planes crashing, hundred voices, everybody's acting it out. I'm all like, don't go in the room, you know. I'm into this book. Drive about three hours. Some of you know where the story is going. I pull into the gas station and I get out and I start to pump the gas. Now I'm not normal. Normal people get out, they pump the gas. Not me. I get out, I stand sideways, pump the gas, and I sing at the top of my lungs in West Virginia. I can't tell you what I was singing, but I was going to town. I was feeling good. Everybody in the gas station is looking at me. I mean, they are coming around the car to look at me. And I'm thinking to myself, what? Am I an oddity in West Virginia? Why is everybody looking at me? I don't get it. So I go into the gas station to get some water. I reach into my pants pocket and I realize that my zipper has come down. My pants are wide open and I have on these bright fluorescent you wear with these big flowers on them. Remember I told you I had on a short shirt. And then I'm mortified but I don't want to like, you know, try to get myself together because I don't want anybody to think I'm back there stealing. So I'm walking up to the counter and I'm like, here you go. So I get in the car and I start fussing at Jesus, which is bad. But you know, he said he wants truth in the inward part. So I tell the truth. I was like, you're the creator of heaven and earth. You couldn't say, hey. You couldn't bring that to my remembrance. You got angels who gave them charge over me. You couldn't have told one of the angels. Story. 
as a reminder to myself <laughs> to take it to the Lord in prayer instead of, you know, worrying about Just today I was worried about something. And then, you know, I get up here, I tell a story, and I remember, what am I worried about? He's got it. However it turns out, he's got it. So, I want to sing the song for you. I wrote it. And, um, once again, as you can tell, being single was a real issue for me. Because I wrote this song because somebody was trying to fix me up with somebody. And they were like, oh, you need to meet so-and-so. He's dying to know you. I was like, like Jesus. She was like, what? I was like, Jesus. He died to know us. And then I turned around and started digging in my purse. She's like, are you writing a song? I was like, yeah, you know how I roll. <laughs> so <laughs> the name of this song is Dying to Know You. And it is track number eight. an introduction There is one who stands waiting to love you Yet here you are weeping inside trying to hide from the pain For a suggestion, there really is a God. He's here. He's not a million miles away. I'm concerned with your pain. There is one who is dying to know you. Nail scarred hands, a wounded side. Let head go. Swallow your pride. Don't try to hide from the one who died to know you. He died to know you. Here's a shocking revelation. If it was only you, he still would have died. Arms open wide to receive. There is one who is dying to know you. A wounded side. Let it go. Swallow your pride. Don't try to hide from the one who died to know you. He died, and he died, but then he rose. His name is Jesus. That's the sweetest name I know. Jesus came down from heaven above. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 
The amazing part is, one, that I did graduate, which just goes to show you God has a plan, too, that I got into college. That's a testament of the New York City school system. <laughs> a sad one. And um, third, that my parents should never have given me a mailbox key. Because this was the days before they called, they would send these cards home and they'd say, your child is in school on this day. Oh, look at that. I got the mail, mom. Yes. I was, yeah, I was sneaky kid. Sneaky, sneaky, sneaky kid. Um, and he was doing dumb stuff, like hanging out on the bench in Central Park. I mean, just dumb stuff. Should have been in school, but that's where I was. Well, I say that because um, when I got to be about 25, 26, had been a Christian a couple years, my mother and I sat down and we had this long talk. And I actually apologized to her. So for all of you ladies who have adult daughters, who have not yet come apologize. There is hope. Just keep, keep that in mind. I went to my mom and I said, you know, I, I did all these things and I know I was wrong. Can you please forgive me? Um, and she, she did. And the wonderful thing about it was she turned around and said, I owe you an apology too, but I need you to know that I did the best I could with what I had at the time. And if I could go back and do it over again, I'd do a lot of things differently, but can't, so I need to apologize to you. And my mom, since that day, my mother has been my best friend. I mean, my mom, that's my dog. <laughs> Mama! She actually um, just left. She was in Nashville with us for about a week, and we had a good time. Because my mother, my mother, you think I'm funny? <laughs> that's a funny lady. Uh -huh. Yeah. And my grandmother, we call my grandmother inappropriate grandmother. Inappropriate grandma. And so my mom was saying something, and we were like, ooh, inappropriate grandma, the sequel. <laughs> so my husband was sitting there, he was like, inappropriate grandma 3D. <laughs> I was like, look at your future. <laughs> there it go. <laughs> so after we had had this talk, maybe about five years after that, I was in the house, I was cleaning up. And I began to think about all these things that I had done as a teenager, and I felt so bad. I mean, like, I started repenting again. I was telling the Lord, I was like, I'm so sorry. Oh my gosh, I don't believe I did this, I did this, I did this. This is another one of those times where I heard the Lord really clearly, and he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And at that moment, that scripture from Psalms came to me that God takes our sins and he removes them as far as the east is from the west. So because I had become a Christian, I'd given my life to, to Jesus and I asked him to forgive me. He didn't even know what I was talking about. That stuff was gone. It was covered, you know, by the blood of God. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, you remember to do so many things. You know, God at this moment knows each and every one of us by name, how many hairs are on our head, how long we'll live, the day, you know, that's appointed that we'll see him face to face. I mean, he knows what we're going to say before we even say it. That's not even thinking about how he keeps the sun rising and setting, brings the seasons and makes it change. He remembers to do all these things because he's such an awesome God. He knows all. But he chooses when we accept him to forget some things. And so I wrote this song, and it's called The Lord Forgot. And I like to encourage people, because I think a lot of times, I know for me particularly, I know God has forgiven me, but sometimes I have a real hard time forgiving myself of stuff, and carry it around for years, which doesn't make any sense, because if God forgave you, and who are you to think that you shouldn't be forgiven? Because he forgave you. If he forgave a thief on a cross right before that thief died, he can forgive us. So the name of this song is called The Lord Forgot, and it is track number seven. Did you write this one? I did write this one. This is my ode to Nashville. You'll hear the music and you'll understand what I mean. You remember to have 
the tide rolling and in due time you roll it out again you remember to give me daily bread and every sparrow by your hand is fed you remember to wipe my tears shield my pain call the angels There are some things you forgot. You forgot all my sins, every lie, every time I made a person cry. My angry words, my selfishness, on my own, I have no defense. From Calvary's cross, shed and applied to save the lost. Now I can say, without the fear, the Spirit of God is always here, forgiven forever, because the Lord. I'm forgiven forever because the Lord forgot. He'll forget all your sins, every lie, every time you made a person cry. Your angry words, your selfishness on our own. No defense except the blood from Calvary's cross shared and applied to save the lost. Now I can say, without the fear, the Spirit of God is always in the end, forgiven forever. Because the Lord forgot, I'm forgiven forever. Because the Lord And um, I like to sing because I think it's a fun song. But it's called Shekels. So if you want to dance, you can get a dance. But if you don't want to dance, you can sit there and just kind of clap your hand, tap your foot, clap your hand, smile real big. I'm so blessed because I, I get to go to all kinds of churches. We were, at the, uh, we were at the Catholic Church on Sunday at the Catholic Festival. And um, it's amazing to see you know, God is so diverse, he's so creative, that he makes people so differently, so people choose to worship in so many different ways. And so sometimes we go to churches, you know, people sit and they smile. Sometimes we go to church and they run up and down the aisles and they roll over, you know. Hallelujah! All kinds of fun stuff. And sometimes we go to the Catholic festival and they're like, and it's over there like, that was beautiful. Like, I didn't have, think he was even listening, but thank you. So, <laughs> we're just so fortunate and so blessed. And I read a quote, and I like to leave this with, with churches. Um, and it said, other churches, and when I say churches, I mean true believers, are not competition. They're just family. Amen. Amen. 
We don't all live in the same place. Everybody, you know, you don't live in all your family. Sometimes you don't live in the same place. You know, God created us as a body. Some of us are arms, and the arms don't do the same thing as the legs. Some of us are mouths. Hallelujah! You know, like that. That's kind of church I like to go to. I just like to go to church, but I don't care. I'm like, where are we going today? How y'all doing? Anyway, so the name of the song is Shackles. And Dan, if you can start it, because it takes like 20 seconds. I don't know why I'm on the track like that. It takes 20 seconds for it to start. Um, this is a fun song, and you may know it because Mandy used to sing it on American Idol. Um, and then she sang it again, and now she's real famous, doing good work for the Lord. So, amen. And it's going to start in a second. What number? Oh, I'm sorry. I might have if I told you the number, right? Number one. <laughs> Again. Right. Yeah, yeah. Somebody once told me I should be a comedian. I was like, I'm not funny. I don't try to be funny. Funny things just happen to me. It is hot, right? <laughs>
Thank you so much, Naima. Um, everybody's welcome to join us downstairs. We have refreshments. And if you feel led to support Naima's ministry, we have a love offering box right in the back as you go out. So thanks again for coming. <laughs>